Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. And this week we have a real treat because it is getting very, very rare to be able to interview Second World War veterans. And I'm recording this the day after the sad news of Bud Anderson's passing. And looking back to my trip to the Pima Air and Space Museum back in February, Andy Bailey set up a fantastic interview with Bob Ryerson. Now, Bob just turned 100 years old the other week, and he flew A-20 Havocs, or if you're of an RAF persuasion, the Boston in the Pacific, flying out of New Guinea and the Philippines, supporting MacArthur's retaking of the island. And Bob was super gracious with his time. So this is the first of a two-parter. This week, we're going to talk to Bob about some of the photos he brought with him and also his training and the route that took him from first seeing an aircraft all the way through to flying the A-20. We're going to look at lots of different aspects of that training, how he went from things like the bamboo bomber to the B-25 before he ever got his hands on an A-20. So that's all this week. And as always, I cannot thank the wonderful team at the Pima Air and Space Museum for the continued support of the Damcasters. And they've got some fantastic stuff coming up. On the 8th of June, they've got their Build a Drone Day. And coming up as well, they have their fantastic Night Wings events, where evenings and night times you get to go around the museum and take photographs of the aircraft as the sun goes down, which out there in the desert is quite extraordinary. So do check them out. They've got some really, really great stuff coming up, including summer programs as well, which we'll talk about at a future time. Their support makes all of this possible. And these two chats with Bob without the team to their help. So once again, many thanks to Andrew Bailey for making this interview happen. And if this is your first time, please do all the fantastic like, subscribe, put some stars into your podcast app of choice if you're of an audio persuasion. And that all helps, really. And stick around for the bit at the end, because if you want to have part two early, you'll need to become a damn castier. But without further ado, it's time to head over and chat to Bob and hear about his journey to the A20 Havoc. Well, Bob, the first question is always, what got you into flying? Had you always wanted to be a pilot or was it just the okay, opportunity fine. of war? Yeah, I'll mm. respond to that. Now, before we start, yep. You want to see some Oh, pictures? yes, of course. Oh, wow. There's two here, too. Anyway, that one. So that's an A-20, you know, a close-up mm -hmm. view of it. Uh, must have been cloudy or rainy that day. Well, not rainy, but anyway. <laughs> um, Is that you? Yes. Good-looking <laughs> chap, sir. <laughs> Yeah, especially if we can get up in the airplane, you know, here's, I know that's not a very sharp photo, but it's, uh, very. Tight. I did a lot of, it was really messed up, and so I did a lot of photo editing mm -hmm. on it. But for your purposes, I, you've never been in an A-20 or No. Where? Yeah, okay. See? You can see the width. Now the the cockpit, it's a cover like on a coffin. Mm -hmm. And so you walk up, to get in it, you walk up here, you come up here. There's a one step that pulls out of the fuselage right here. Okay. And then there's a, a tow hold. I just don't think it shows on here. Mm -hmm. You tow, and you do left foot here, right here, and then you're left on the wing. Okay. And walk up here, and you see the, and that's open back, I think, to there. Oh, so, so that whole section comes up? Yeah. Yeah. It's over the, the front of the bomb bay, mm -hmm. and the gas tank, and you see, now in Europe, they flew A-20s with two gunners, mm -hmm. one in the turret and one in an open underneath. Okay. And I have a friend, had a friend that flew in A-20s in Africa and Italy. Uh, 
And that's how they did. But you see, they can't get up here. Okay. You can have radio transportation. So, and so you're, you're cut off. There's, there's no tube or anything to slide no, down. No. And, yeah. Yeah. If the pilot's unconscious, they're just out of luck. Oh, dear. But uh, the purpose there was they were not flying low level. Mm -hmm. They were flying five, ten thousand feet. Yeah. And dropping a small bomb load. Um, we went, we trained with two gunners and took two gunners overseas to the Pacific. Never flew with more than one. Okay. So they had a tough time getting their time in and they transferred out. Yeah. But anyway, that's. So you go in the air and this flips up and then you, you get in. Uh, but I wanted to show you a little bit here. You see the column, the control column is a, a wheel except there's nothing up across here. Yep. Uh, there were instruments up here. The right hand, the th th thumb was the bomb bay over on your right hand, mm -hmm. you're, uh, you're holding here, just over here, just sort of like this, except that up here is the trigger for bombs, or the, and this is the trigger for the guns. Okay. And so, it, and this is the throttles. i just looking here, I don't know where the mixture control is. Hmm. I would have thought it was right there, but it doesn't yeah. show it, yeah. so I'm not might, sure Might be pushed forward, anyway. might be, yeah. <clears throat> so, weapons on the right, throttle controls on the left, and that was, that was it, really. <laughs> keep, keep, keeps, you, keeps you occupied. Yeah, 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 you, you, <laughs> you kind of got to be ambidextrous. <laughs> This is is a picture I took. I was this was a typical mm -hmm. flight pattern. The pilot, one plane on the right, one plane on the left, flying up. Okay. Flying a little higher. Now, are you familiar with the Douglas A26? Yes. I don't know if uh, I'll show you some things on there. Okay. I don't know if you want me to talk about them here or not, but. Feel free, you, you tell but, us. No, I know that I just want to give you background yep. now and then you can do what you want to. So we were used to flying close formation to and from the target. Yep. Now we might go over the target as a three ship, we might go over with nine ships abreast, you might go over it singly, yep. different ways. But to and from the target, we flew close formation. As a matter of discipline. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have to, but that, that was the discipline. Um, a contrast with the B-24 mm -hmm. had a reputation for not being able to fly close formation. Mm -hmm. It was tough for those pilots to fly when they're and it was, a, I understand, it was a difficult plane to fly close formation. It, it probably just wasn't that responsive to the controls. And part okay. of it, it had a Davis wing. Yeah. And uh, I just think that probably that whole thing, either that or wing space in mm -hmm. controls in relation to weight, or, but anyway, it had a reputation for being difficult to fly. This was good to fly, you know, okay. and, and we did. But anyway, all of our missions were low level, and that's from 10 feet to 100 feet. <laughs> <laughs> and so the guy underneath, all he had was an opening. Yeah. And in Europe, they flew that, I think, with a free swinging 30 caliber, could have been a 50. Mm -hmm. But if you're flying that low level, that he can't see anything or do anything. He's just getting leaves in his face. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that, is, that is a beautiful photo. So wh where, where was this taken? This is off the coast of, of, of the Philippines. Okay. It just happened. We were on the way to a, to a, mm -hmm. on a mission. 
yep. and going someplace up there, and I took this. And you, and you had color film with you. Isn't that interesting how well that's done? Yes. Uh, of course, this is a reproduction, but even, tw uh, I don't know if I went back to those prints 15 years ago, but I, uh, I could have. And, you mm -hmm. know, those color, color, color were pretty good. Yeah. To hold up that long. It's beautiful, yeah. Just how bright the sea was as well. Just that sort of azure blue, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. So how did flying start for you? What was your, your first dream of being a pilot? Well, on a farm in southern Wisconsin when I was growing up, and the, you know, there weren't many airplanes then, but yep. once in a while see an airplane fly over and uh, I'd wonder, well, how come that disappears? Mm -hmm. But then, and then, I heard there was a plane had land, had had a emergency landing up about a mile from where our, where our farmhouse was. So I ran up there. Well, it was a guy in a just a s small single mm -hmm. airplane flying across the country, and he had uh, an emergency problem. He just landed and he worked on his engine for a while and got it fixed and took off. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of my early exposure. And I didn't have much other than occasional airplanes until the war came along. Okay. You know, and I heard about the aviation cadet program and applied to it. So, and what, what year did you apply to the program? 1942. Okay. And how old were you in 1942? 18. Oh. Yeah, 18. A, a, young, a young man wanting to fly. Sure. Yeah. yeah. In 1942, in the summer, I applied to the aviation cadet program mm -hmm. because there was a representative of what was then the Army Air Corps. Yeah. There was no Air Force. It was the Army Air Corps, the Navy Air Corps, I guess the Marine Air Corps, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I applied, but my teeth weren't good enough. They said, no, not. get your teeth fixed and we'll consider you. Okay. So I went back again in uh, November of 42, mm -hmm. and then they accepted me and said, okay, we'll let you, we'll call you up mm -hmm. sometime. And so the first week of January of 43, and so we reported to Chicago and they put us on a train, go down to Shep Shepherd Field in Wichita Falls, mm -hmm. Texas. And we had a one month army, regular army basic training for just like all the rest of the <laughs> army New Army people I can tell you that, that that's the worst climate I've ever <laughs> been in because we'd get up in the morning and it'd be cold and we'd put on wool underwear and all the coats we could and go stand in line for breakfast and we'd be freezing <laughs> at exercise and uh, drill and uh, calisthenics and so forth, and at noon we'd take off all this clothing, put on the summer underwear, just a shirt and pants, mm -hmm. in the afternoon we'd stand parade at 5, 5.15 in the afternoon, they'd have the ambulances lined up to carry them away that are, had fainted <laughs> standing at, in parade. So uh, it, it was interesting to go through that wide a temperature yep. every day. And I think that was, that's tough on the health. Yeah. That, uh, and eventually they shipped us out to a college training detachment in Shawnee, Oklahoma, Oklahoma Baptist University. Okay. And uh, so for some so-called college training detachment uh, and some, some basics there. 
and uh, so many people were coughing when we got up there that they thought we were doing it purposely. <laughs> we really weren't. It just was, had been a tough climate for a lot of us. Anyway, then uh, after about two months there, they pulled some of us out mm -hmm. and uh, sent us to San Antonio for a um, classification and training to okay. see whether we really qualified for pilot training or not or what how they sh how they would use us okay and so we went there and they did the normal testing on site and physical and coordination and so forth but she did some other things too like put us in a oxygen place where they can reduce the oxygen mm -hmm. and see how long it takes us to pass out. Yep. What kind of altitude, simulated altitude it would take mm -hmm. before we'd pass out from lack of oxygen or limited oxygen. Mm -hmm. And we did some kind of a centri centrifuge. Centri centrifugal this going yeah, around centrifuge. Around these, yeah. yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah. It would be a centrifuge. Mm -hmm. So some things like that. But and of course the eyesight and the mm -hmm. but eyesight and coordination. And so after that, I guess uh, we some get sorted out all mm -hmm. every place along every step along the way. But some of us then got sent to a primary training facility, and we'll look at a primary training mm -hmm. airplane that we flew. Yep. PT-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that was at Mustang Field in Oklahoma. Uh, and then um, that would be about nine weeks. Okay. Then we go on to basic training, mm -hmm. and uh, that was at Garden City, Kansas, and we flew then on BT-13. Okay. And again, nine weeks there. What What was your first flight like, the first time you flew properly? Well, the first time I flew, I got airsick, you know, <laughs> and... Uh, this wasn't wasn't a good thing either, mm. um, and the instructor was patient, and said, "Well, we'll try it again tomorrow," mm -hmm. and uh, kind of as as long as you're doing the flying, you don't you don't uh, you probably don't get sick. Mm -hmm. But when the instructor takes over and he wants to do some flying too, mm. that's when you tend to get. Nausea. Yeah. But he uh, gave me some advice on what to eat before going up and so forth, and just getting used to it a little, it got over it. But I found that uh, 25, 30 years later, when I was flying in a Cessna 140 with a guy, and uh, he was flying, and I'm pretty sure, and I'm feeling nausea, and I, I said, better let me fly it for a little bit. <laughs> so it, it's so, interesting on that, that. So w when you're in control, your stomach's happy, but when someone else is, it's not. Well, I suppose it's you're distracted. Yes. You know? yeah. So it's something about that, yes. Mm -hmm. So go on. Now, should I turn and face the camera at all or you, not? You can do whatever you like. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's just however you want to, yeah. however you feel comfortable. So if you want to say hello to everybody, you can. <laughs> <laughs> hello, everybody. <laughs> and basic training then, we started to do some acrobatics. We didn't do much acrobatics in the primary trainer. Do some acrobatics and uh, a variety of things. But also there, the, uh, we were, after, after finishing basic mm -hmm. training, 
what was going to happen next depended on our height. Yep. And those that were more than six feet tall were headed for uh, multi-engine airplanes. Mm -hmm. Those under six feet were headed for fighters. And I was 6'1", so I was headed for multi-engine. Well, in most cases, that means the B-24s and the B-17s mm -hmm. at that time. And of course- Did you, you, did you try to scooch down to get <laughs> under six foot? <laughs> no, couldn't do that. I would like to have, but I couldn't. And, uh, but, but multi-engine was also the A-20s, the B-25s, the B-26s, mm -hmm. which was, a, at that time, was a Martin B-26. Yep. But they also had some kind of list, and uh, we could list our preference mm -hmm. of what we wanted to go into. Well, I didn't know much of anything about an A-20, but I signed up for the A-20 anyway. Okay. And, uh, but then I think that, that could have been, a, well, anyway, we were going to multi-engine. Yeah. And so advanced, they sent us to uh, San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Now, the second month in basic, they put us in a UC-78 bamboo bomber. Okay. Wooden spars and the wings. Mm -hmm. It's a, a basic multi-engine trainer, which until then they'd used, that had been used in advanced. Okay as an advanced multi-engine trainer. Mm -hmm. But they were trying a new program and they ran us into this, the second month or second half of basic training. And then when we went to San Antonio, Brooks Field, then we transitioned into B-25s. We were the first group that they were gonna try to use B-25s as an advanced trainer. That must have been a jump. That was a big jump, that's right. <laughs> but it is even a big jump for the instructors yeah. because the instructors weren't that used to B-25s either, mm -hmm. and they were used to one of the things you were doing would do in introduction to multi-engine power off landings. Well, if you pull the power off on a B-25, it's a pretty steep decline. Mm -hmm. And so pretty quick they learned to keep a little power back <laughs> on, on the... It, it, it was a bit of a brick when it didn't have power, wasn't it, the B-25? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And also, when you get into a heavier airplane like that, if you got the power off, then you decide you don't want to land or that you're landing approaching too short mm -hmm. or something else to push the power. It takes a little while for that power to mm. have enough effect to break the glide. So you're having to think ahead at all times in a B-25. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. And it's a matter, I, a lot of it is the wing loading when you're talking, mm -hmm. start talking about combat airplanes. It's a heavier weight in proportion to the wing surface. Okay. So that, uh, there, it, there's not so much forgiving okay. in terms of what you do or don't do. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, they put us in the 25s as advanced, and we supposedly were, were the first class to go through that. But uh, long since then, they used B-25s for a long time after World War II mm -hmm. as a as a basic trainer for the pilots, so I was surprised at that. Mm. But anyway, that was our experience in San Antonio. And at that time, so much of the Air Corps centered at San Antonio, and certainly everything in this in the South Central. Okay. It was, the uh, Randolph Field was a very historic base. Mm -hmm for the Army Air Corps, and that was just outside of San Antonio. How, how many people were in your class? I don't know, that's a good question. 
question. I, I, it's really just a guess at this point, 125, something like that. Okay. So it's, a, it's a lot of people all going through on, yes. on that course, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and what was life like at Randolph Field? Well, we weren't at Randolph Field. We okay. visited Randolph, oh, right. okay. but we okay. were based at Brooksfield, which was right on the edge of, of San Antonio. But uh, it wasn't bad, you know. We're in the typical barracks, and, mm -hmm. and they're trying to exercise some discipline and introduce discipline to us and get us to <laughs> follow it. But it was pretty, you know, pretty comfortable. Now, I think we'd, we might fly part of the day, but a lot of the day, ground school mm -hmm. and instruction and a lot of physical training and marching and so forth and so on. So, um, and they keep you busy, get you up early in the morning and <clears throat> in regular hours for eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yep. Um, but, uh, that wasn't bad because it it wasn't the the Air Corps after you got started in it wasn't the uh, strict physical training and strict discipline that the regular Army and I'm sure the regular Navy mm -hmm. uh, exercised in the early in their training. I I would guess training on a B-25 takes a lot of effort, so that's going to keep you pretty fit as well. No, that wasn't physically difficult. Okay. Um, when you got into the, uh, especially the B-24, um, it was a long ways out to the control surfaces mm. on the B-24. And uh, I think they said this, the B-24 pilots ended up with a big muscle on their left arm. <laughs> so it wasn't that much for us. Okay. Now, mentally pushing because you got to pay attention and you're, a lot of our training was in formation and there you got to, you got to watch what you're doing and yep. still you're trying to check your engine instruments and, and work on the radio. And uh, just like one night, we did a lot of night training. In fact, we didn't, we, there was enough weather came in from the coast and we'd be out flying in the late after, early evening and just mm -hmm. getting, it's dark. We fly for a while and then the word would come in, get get on the ground, the fog's coming in, and it's coming in from the coast, from the Gulf Coast, and uh, we would, but we didn't get enough flying time in, so they held us over for an extra month to okay. get sufficient flight training. Uh, but anyway, one night with an instructor and one or two pilots in one plane and then two other B-25 with two students mm -hmm. in each one. And uh, we flew from San Antonio to uh, Oklahoma City. Okay. And then turned around and went back to San Antonio. But on the way back, we're getting towards Fort Worth mm -hmm. And the instructor said, well, my family lives down here in, in, <laughs> in Fort Worth, so we're going to go down. We didn't go down real low, but I think we went down to about 500 feet with three B-25, just as, <laughs> just as it's getting to be daylight and go over <laughs> Dallas. So I, I think they heard us. <laughs> what woke everybody up. Yeah, yeah. I think so. But anyway, that's a, we do some of that training too. Fly all fly mm -hmm. for four or five hours at night. So, 
at what point do they tell you you're going on to the A20? Well, that's I'm uh, I'm not even sure when they when we had to pick, but anyway. Then oh, so, it, so you still got to pick even even through well, training. Well, you weren't... got to list what your yeah. preference was. <laughs> you really didn't get your preference to be filled. Right. You didn't expect mm -hmm. it to be filled. But anyway, we listed. Well, I was lucky enough that to get into the A20. So it was just at the end of advanced training in mm -hmm. San Antonio when we got our wings. Yep. And we got our appointment as a second lieutenant in the Air Corps. And uh, so that graduation took place at San Antonio, mm -hmm. and they shipped us off, some of us that were going to A-20s, not any big number, to Florence, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Oh, important question. What was the party like when you got your wings? Well, <laughs> it wasn't all that great. We oh. had... <laughs> uh, I. I, there wasn't any ga place for a gathering. Oh, right, okay. And uh, so I, I, um, some of us, I know some of us went in town and I came, when I came back home, uh, I was a little woozy. <laughs> but uh, it, it wasn't, it just didn't seem like any opportunity for a big party. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they uh, shipped us off to Florence, South Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, and we started the training in the A-20. Now, mm -hmm. let's see if, if there's anything else on that training. No, I, we were in the South Central Training Command, so you see the bases that I mentioned were Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, so I, I think they had the United States divided up probably in three training commands, mm -hmm. the Southeast, South Central, and Southwest. Okay. Uh, they weren't anxious to do much training in <laughs> Wisconsin <laughs> because it'd be limited in the, much more limited in the flying time and yeah. just much more difficult to keep the planes operating well and so D forth. Digging them out of the snow. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So, but anyway, for many of us, it was so new to be out of, for me, to be out of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I'd been out some, but not that much. Right. Now you're in an entirely different area yep. with uh, not only the climate, but uh, even the food is different. <laughs> but anyway, it was a, for me, it was a in, very interesting and a good experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also in the different steps that we'd taken. Some of the people that were knocked out, maybe coordination, maybe response to having to make quick decisions, uh, if they were kicked out of pilot training, a lot of those went to bombardier or navigator training. Okay. And so they'd go a different direction. But that's what happened to, to a lot of them. That's mm -hmm. where the, a lot of the bombardiers and navigators came from. Okay. Been kicked out of pilot training. Because they, they would say they were too smart for being a pilot. <laughs> 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 well... Yeah, and, you know, there's there's difference in personality of people that I didn't realize at that time. But gradually since then, uh, one case, uh, a cousin of mine, uh, later we were talking, and he'd been in Selfridge Field, Michigan, as an enlisted man. And he worked in the as bartender in the officers club. Well, mm -hmm. you know, this is I, he's off getting some additional income from mm -hmm. that. 
but he said there's a difference between the bomber pilots and the fighter pilots. I said, what is it? Well, he said, in the bar, he said, the bomber pilots are sitting there, they're quiet, they don't jump up and run around much. <laughs> he said, the table with the tables with the fighter pilots, he says, they're loud, they're laughing, <laughs> carrying on, they're jumping up and down, running around. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so you guys were the more serious of the group. Well, I think we were. I think we. I think I'm in between. Oh right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to have been flying fighter fighters, and I think maybe I would have done okay. Mm. But I think I'm in between. But why is this? I don't know. But. <clears throat> I just had a recent example on this, too. Okay. I'm long since retired, but in Green Valley, I'm in a retirement group with about 700 residents. But one of them was a uh, fighter pilot twice in Vietnam. But uh, we were talking recently, and, and uh, there was some other occupation that, that we were talking about, and he said, well, I sure wouldn't want to do that. Well, what it is, he's a guy that wants to make quick decisions. Mm. And uh, like he has a hard time playing bridge because you got to think. <laughs> yes. Well, that's not what he wants to do. He wants to look at his card, wham, <laughs> and make a decision. Well, I think that's what a... Not just fighter pilots, pilots need to, at times, make quick decisions. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think a fighter pilot especially has to make those quick decisions. And he, and he, that's what he wanted to do. He, and that's what he's good at. Yeah. So it's a difference in personality, too. I, I think that's very interesting, that you have those different attitudes to the job that in a fighter you have to be quick you have to be sharp to be fair for you you'd have to be pretty sharp and pretty quick at low level as well so there's, there's a little bit of combination of, of the two yeah 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 there is mm -hmm. but we're going to get on to that in a minute okay <laughs> All right, Florence, South Carolina. Yep. Well, you know, in an A-20, there's only room for one pilot. The, you sit in the cockpit, and the sides of the cockpit are right by your elbow. So you don't have dual instruction in an A-20. Mm -hmm. Now, that's so in some of the fighters, too. It was at the time. Um, so you do, you're in Florence, South Carolina, we'd sit in that cockpit a lot and try to get used to the controls, and you went through ground school mm -hmm. and so forth. But the first and first flight you make, you're all by yourself. There's no instructor. So he sent you off, and you're supposed to take off and circle the field and land mm -hmm. and do them both successfully. So you, you do that a few times, and then you start doing more. He's, the instructor tells you to do, go out and do this mm -hmm. and do that and so forth. Would, would an instructor fly with you in another aircraft? No. no. To no, just go not off? Not initially. Yeah. And, and not, he'd tell you, go do, go do so-and-so. Uh, but no, now then after a while he'd go with you because then you practice formation flying. Okay. And formation flying was so much of a basic part of combat training in World War II. Yeah. Because especially for the four engine bombers, mm -hmm. they needed to stay in formation because the the mast guns that the bombers had was their defense against the enemy fighters. Yeah. And uh, 
So it was, it maybe early on it was so also for the A20s and B25s. Now, when I was in the Pacific as a replacement pilot in late 44, the Japanese fighters had either been shot down or withdrawn. Mm -hmm. And so formation flying wasn't that important to us, but still, we flew close formation to and from the target. And I think it's part of discipline and they just don't want some okay. of us wandering around the skies. <laughs> but anyway, back to the early time in the 20s, we practiced a lot of really standard things that in any airplanes headed for combat, you, you need to do. And we did, later we did a lot of formation flying. But anyway, the A-20 um, handled so good that after I'd flown about four or five times, I tried it on a uh, barrel roll, which is just flying mm -hmm. around. Well, it handled beautifully and it handled better on a counterclockwise than I did on a clockwise. Okay. And I think there's something about the engine torque, mm -hmm. the torque on the engines. And even though there's two engines, they're not, they're not offsetting each other. Mm -hmm. Now I think maybe the A20s had offsetting engines in terms of the way they, yeah. they rotated. Mm -hmm. But the other twin engines, the both engines rotated the same way. Okay. And so that contributed to the torque. What this was, the next day I happened to be flying the same plane. Mm -hmm. And the crew chief said, Lieutenant, you shouldn't do acrobatics <laughs> in these airplanes. He says, uh, the, the could be some things rolling around that would jam the controls. <clears throat> and he said, also, the batteries are not made for inverted flight. <laughs> so you learn. Yes. But anyway, we did oh, a lot oh, of... Always listen to the crew chief. Yes, that's mm. right. He's, uh, another time... In training at Florence, we were out flying with a group of, uh, I think, nine airplanes, mm -hmm. formation flying. It happened to be a day when there was not a high ceiling. I think the cloud ceiling was around 3,000. But anyway, the plane I was flying, every time I'd push the throttles up, the uh, one engine would backfire and lose power. So I could keep some power on, but not a lot. Well, that's t hard to fly formation when you don't have full use of both. And I called the guy that was in the instructor there and said, I got problems with this engine. And uh, he says, well, you know, can you find your way back to Florence? And I said, yeah, I could. Well, I went, so I, I went on back and landed, and then I, we report to the crew chief any problems that there are, right. not only to crew chief. We report it in writing for the log for the airplane. And the crew chief said, well, he said, I've been telling them for a week that they, we should change that engine, <laughs> change, put a new engine in. So, yeah, the crew chiefs, understand a lot about the uh, airplane. I remember being told that it's the crew chief's airplane, the pilot just borrows it. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> and, and breaks it. Huh? And the pilot breaks it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, from, you wanna, shall we go on from there when we finished up there, and we trained them. We were assigned two gunners, mm -hmm. so we trained together. 
So we, when we got through there, we got orders to go to Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Well, Savannah, Georgia, we found out was a departure point for going overseas. Some go east and some go west. We didn't know what, where we were going to end up, so we just report there, and then every day, you got to. We assemble, and they call roll the hundred people, hundred or hundred and twenty-five mm -hmm. crews, and uh, so after a week or ten days, our crew. Our crew and six other A-20 crews got called, you come over here. Mm -hmm. Well, what it was, we were headed for the Pacific. Okay. And so they put the 21 of us on a Pullman car with a porter. Oh, and nice. headed us west. <laughs> And so that's the way we traveled from the East Coast to the West Coast. We'd pull in someplace like Kansas City and they'd unhook us in the middle of the freight yard and we'd sit there for a while. Pretty soon they'd hook us on another, another train and head us on west for another segment. And <laughs> whenever we were on a, on a whatever, train we were on, there'd be a dining car on there, and that's where we'd go get our food. Nice. So it wasn't a bad trip at all. <laughs> <laughs> There's worse ways to be sent to cross country. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Now, early on when we'd been in training in the South Central Command, go someplace to San Antonio to Oklahoma or Oklahoma to Kansas, it'll be in these old, I forgot there was a name for them, these old passenger cars that had a, a, a rigid, rigid back, back to them and the back could either go this way or this way, but it didn't recline. Okay. And uh, it didn't, we didn't need they didn't think we needed to recline on our trip. <laughs> we could sit there or stand whatever we wanted to do. <laughs> well, anyway, we went across the country, and so that, that was an interesting trip. But anyway, we show up in Oakland, California, and they have a bus to pick us up, and we go up to Hamilton Field, north of San Francisco. And what that was was just a uh, staging base mm -hmm. for going overseas. I don't remember what they called it, Hamilton Field, but anyway. And so the, we're there, of course, that was kind of nice. We'd, we we restricted to the field until five o'clock in the afternoon. And if we hadn't been notified that we were leaving, why well, we could go into San Francisco. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what, the, there's a hotel there. I should remember the name, I don't. But anyway, a hotel that was a gathering point mm -hmm. for military in the bar. Even one night there, I ran into uh, the, the principal from my high school days <laughs> who was now in the Navy with a, a Navy officer and ran into him in the bar <laughs> in San Francisco. But anyway, we'd go in there. And uh, so one day we were told, not going any place, you're going to leave tonight. So you get your stuff together and ready. Well, and so it, it was a rainy night, and they assembled us someplace, and about 3 o'clock in the morning, a B-24 that had been converted for passenger use mm -hmm. by the military uh, landed 
And this is the plane we're going to depart on in a couple hours. And it was pouring rain, and I was so impressed with being able to land in bad weather conditions because we'd had some, we'd have some instrument training, but boy, it's limited. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, anyway, this plane, and so they, they had to do some provisioning on that plane. And uh, they loaded the 21 of us, the t same 21 that had come across the country. So, we, so the whole same group got position the same, the same group, as well? Yeah. Yep. yep. Got on that plane and, and we left. And the sun, it was just, again, just daybreak. And mm -hmm. the, there was a fog, except Golden Gate Bridge was showing all above the fog mm -hmm. as we flew west. Yeah. So that flight from there to uh, Honolulu and landed to Honolulu and same thing, spend some time there, spend a week there or whatever. And again, you get notice you're leaving. C-54, which was then uh, early days of the uh, C-54 is a four engine transport. I can't remember who made those, but anyway, they were. I think, were, I think it, it's a, does no, it not? the DC-3 is the two engine. Sorry, the DC-4. Is it the four with the four engines? I can never remember. I, we, we called them a C-52. Yeah. And uh, we went out of Lair and landed at Johnston Island. Well, Johnston Island is out in the middle of the Pacific, halfway between uh, Hawaiian Islands and New Guinea. And it's a small island, uh, and they don't even have fresh water there. So we landed there and thought we were, you know, go f go find a PX and mm -hmm. walk around a little. And they said, no, you're not going any place. All we're doing is getting gas, and there isn't anything here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what they did. They got gas, and we went on to New Guinea to NADZAB, N-A-D-Z-A-B, which was a combat replacement and training center. It was a holding point for to have replacement crews, so when a combat group gave them word, we, we'd like to, ha we want three new crews up here, or, or however many they wanted. Uh, it, it ended up that the seven crews continued to be ordered up on the same orders to report to the 417th bomb group. So this... So you stayed together all the way from Savannah straight out through to New Guinea. And, and to the Philippines. Yeah. And to the Philippines. I know that's a really cheeky spot to break up this episode just before Bob heads out to the Pacific. But as you can tell, this is a long and in-depth interview. So I cannot thank Bob Ryerson enough for joining us on the show. Next week, we get into lots of exciting stuff. Bob's journey out to the New Guinea and the Pacific, joining the 417th Bomb Group, and what he got up to supporting the troops in the Philippines. If you want to see that right away, you can become a damn castier over on Patreon for just three pounds a month. You get all of these episodes as soon as I've put them together. And you get to join us in with our Zoom socials and also the chats that we have going in the group chatty thing that patrons introduced as well. So that's just three pounds a month plus a bit of that. And of course, when we do things live, if you're around, you're more than welcome to join me as we start recording the next episode. So next week, not only does Bob tell us about flying the A-20 in combat, we put Bob back into an A-20. So that was a real thrill. And Bob seemed to like it too. Until next time, thank you so much for joining us. Do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.